prompt this edition of Sightings, Mexico City, 1991, the location for the largest mass UFO sighting in history. Hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets of Mexico. This was a massive phenomenon. Now, the visitors are back. If they are here, now they are telling us it's possible to travel through the stars. Then, in 1953, a CIA LSD experiment went terribly wrong. He <laughs> went through the window. Suicide or murder? Forensic scientists and psychic investigators try to uncover the truth. Plus, are scientists about to create a real-life Jurassic Park? This is dangerous technology. Later, do identical twins share a bond that transcends death? I had a tremendous jolt, and I knew it was my twin. And this woman believes we can see the world through our pet's eyes. We're born with the ability to communicate telepathically with animals. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Last year, Sightings brought you exclusive videotape of the largest mass UFO sighting in history. Wave after wave of unidentified flying objects were sighted by thousands of eyewitnesses in Mexico City. A Sightings investigative team has been keeping tabs on the Mexico sightings and report that they are not only continuing, but they are growing in frequency. In 1991, Thousands of citizens in Mexico City looked to the heavens. Astronomers from around the world brought high-powered telescopes. Many people had video cameras. They were there to see the last full solar eclipse for three centuries. But as day turned to night, there was something else in the twilight sky. UFOs, lots of them, recorded at the same time by different people from locations throughout central Mexico. Mass sightings on this scale are rare, and ufologists describe the event as a flap. One journalist who witnessed the original mass sighting has spearheaded a continuing effort to understand what exactly is going on. Jaime Musson, Mexico's most respected television reporter and host of Mexico's version of 60 Minutes, is the guiding force behind a project to collate, archive, and study this flap. From the day of the eclipse of July 11, 1991, we have had the most incredible flap that has ever been recorded or keep it as evidence. A police officer caught one view of a suspected craft from a surveillance camera set up to capture drug traffickers. And this daylight video footage was taken by a Catholic priest who believes the Bible supports the possibility of extraterrestrial life forms. Uh, Christ speaks of his kingdom not being of this world, that his angels help him. We are so small, and the universe is something so big that we cannot begin to understand all that is out there. Why Mexico City? Why 1991? Some researchers found what they believe to be an answer in Mexico's ancient Maya culture. Pyramids south of Mexico City have given rise to the theory that these structures, built with extraordinary technical sophistication, were actually built with the assistance of an advanced extraterrestrial race. Were these pyramids built with a mysterious purpose in mind that has somehow beckoned extraterrestrial visitors back to the region centuries after the Maya civilization vanished? And then there is the astronomical calendar devised by the Maya centuries ago. Some archaeologists believe that the calendar accurately predicted the solar eclipse of 1991 and has also made predictions about UFO visitations. The July 11th eclipse that we witnessed was forecasted thousands of years ago on the code of dressed in eclipse table of the Mayan civilization. The Maya referred to the periods between eclipses as suns. These suns last up to 500 years. The fifth sun ended on the eclipse of July 11th. It was predicted in some form, like the era of the New Enlightenment. The sixth sun is the return to the epic of Enlightenment. 
Could the continuing Mexico City flap be a harbinger of the enlightenment predicted in the Maya calendar? Are the UFOs that have continued to appear almost daily since 1991 trying to send us a message? Hundreds of amateur videotapes have been shot in the search for that message. It was an object that was flying overhead at a low altitude in the area which I live. It was an object in the form, shall we say, of a top. It was suspended over a tower. It was revolving around. It stopped spinning and began to move across. It hid itself behind a building. I looked at the sky and there were some bubbles. To me, it looked like a pearl. So I shot it with my camera. While I'm taping, I observed through the lens that it split or separated. There is a concerted effort in both civilian and academic circles to get to the bottom of the UFO mystery. At El Grupo Sol of Mexico City University, courses are taught in computer analysis of supposed UFO film and video. Video tapes have been pouring into the university since the project was first announced. Amateur videographers have formed clubs to compare notes, and courses are offered on the proper techniques for videotaping UFOs. While most of the videotapes collected so far offer only quick, tantalizing glimpses of suspicious objects, a few are worthy of serious consideration. On January 1st, 1993, several metallic-looking orbs were captured on tape. Just in front of me, approximately 1,500 feet, uh, I was looking to an object that I have never seen before. I can tell you that was not normal. It was suspended in the air. It was moving just a little bit to the sides, up and down and left and right, uh, in the same place for, for almost 15 minutes. Manuel Lozcano was not the only person who witnessed the unusual New Year's Day event in 1993. Thousands, I would say, hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets of Mexico, and all of them looked at very strange things. This was a, a massive phenomenon. Then it's very difficult for the t scientists or for the skeptics to try to, to say no or try to invent any kind of tale around this. It means now that we don't think the same way we did three or four years ago. And that's very important. If you really want to see what is going up up there, you have to have an open mind, otherwise you won't see that. And I believe that American people should learn from this experience. I think that if you start looking to the sky with an open mind, you are gonna see things that you never expected before. The Mexico City UFOs have been front page news in Mexico since the mass sightings began in 1991. But strangely, a computer search here could not find a single article about the phenomenon in any American publication. More on this suspicious discrepancy when sightings continues. Next, our Mexico City investigation continues, and some believe the visitors have come with a message. Here we saw something flashing or strobing occasionally. What is flying over Mexico City? Well, even the most skeptical of expert sightings interviewed agrees that the UFOs are manufactured craft with an independent propulsion system. What is in dispute is who is manufacturing them and who's flying them. The largest mass sighting anywhere in the world occurred over Mexico City on New Year's Day, 1993. Television and newspaper reporters couldn't chalk this one up to hysterical kooks. We went to the building next door in order to tape the lights that all the people were watching. There were journalists and cameramen. First, there was one object, and then two. With that crucial event on January 1st, journalists throughout Mexico went from reporters to eyewitnesses. La Prensa is Mexico City's second largest daily newspaper. Reporter Genoviva Ortiz's account of the New Year's flap was front page news. I arrived at the editorial room around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon when we began to notice a commotion among the people in the streets. 
the people were coming out of their homes, all the automobiles were stopping, and everybody was looking up at the sky. A long time ago, there was this belief, I think among the media professionals, the journalists. But now, with so many occurrences, we believe, and we accept things the way they are. Photos, videos, people's comments. They have shown us that something more exists, right? Not just us. While the ongoing UFO sightings are headline news in Mexico City, they remain virtually unreported in the American media. Are we missing a rare opportunity to learn about long-term UFO sightings? Why are journalists here so nonchalant about the Mexico flap? Sightings brought several of the Mexican videotapes to a video engineer in Nevada. He uses the same image analysis computer used by the Department of Defense to enhance raw satellite data. Because of the sensitive nature of his work, he is asked to remain anonymous. His analysis of the tapes revealed startling details that Mexican investigators had not previously seen. Initially, we took some time to look at uh, a blow-up and enlargement of the object that everybody sees in the motion video, and happened to see a flash of light down in this area of the screen. Uh, we went down there and enlarged it, and we see something here that doesn't seem to follow the general geometry of the image. There seemed to be another spot right in here um, that was, this area in here was flashing or strobing occasionally. And here we saw, again, something that didn't seem to be sensible with the rest of the image. It's pretty much not anything that we can readily identify as an existing aircraft or helicopter. Why are reporters in the United States disinterested in the largest continuing mass sighting in recorded history? Why do they treat as suspect tens of thousands of eyewitnesses and over 1,500 videotapes? If you want to really be really truthful and you believe this is real, you have to tell it. It doesn't matter if it's risky. It doesn't matter if they are going to tell you that you are crazy. It doesn't matter if you lose your credibility, if you are acting as an honest man. As the Mike Wallace of Mexico, Jaime Musson has reason to be concerned about his credibility. But the mass sightings Musson has witnessed fuel his passion. And many people was afraid when I started presenting this, if I was going to lose my credibility. I am investigator. My duty is to investigate, and my duty is to do it for the benefit of the people. If you have the courage and you believe in it, and it's true, uh, you will be supported by people. And to do that uh, is very risky, and I know that's why many of my partners, probably in the United States, don't do that. On balance, Musan and his colleagues throughout Mexico have not reported alien abductions, extraterrestrials disguised as DEA agents, or intergalactic ultimatums. They are simply reporting what they are seeing and what they believe they will continue to see for years to come. If they are here, we will be there tomorrow. They are proving with their presence here that it's possible to travel through the stars. It's the only reason science hasn't accepted the presence of these beings here, because we don't know how to travel these tremendous distances in the stars or in the universe between the galaxies. But if they are here, now they are telling us, hey, take it easy, take it easy. It's possible to travel through the stars, and it's all that matters at this moment. Since this latest report was completed, Sightings has been contacted by a commercial airline pilot who claims that he was involved in a near miss between his DC-9 and a UFO. We'll bring you his complete story on an upcoming program. Coming up, do identical twins share a unique bond in life and death? And I knew it was my twin, and his spirit rose up from me, and my spirit wanted to go with him. Identical twins share a unique biological bond, and life studies of identical twins have shown that they can also share a unique psychic bond. But what happens when one twin dies? Is the psychic bond between identical twins so strong 
that it can reach out from the grave. They have shared the same parents, the same egg, the same genetic makeup. So is it possible that identical twins can also, in some supernatural way, share the same soul? When I walked in the room, two of the nurses says, oh my God, and, and start crying, because we're identical I mean, in every way. And when I saw her laying there, it was, it was like half my life is laying there. They are called twinless twins, the remaining half of a whole separated only by death. Because they came into the world together, because they were of the same developmental stage and shared so many life history events from infancy onward, it becomes a very, very special loss. And birthdays that used to be very happy occasions now become days of mourning. And many twinless twins report that although death has severed the physical bond they shared, a psychic bond lives on beyond the grave. I was up on a power pole and I wasn't touching any energized conductors, but all of a sudden I had the most tremendous jolt went through my body as if I'd taken an electric shock and I knew it wasn't me because I wasn't touching anything energized, but I and then I knew it was my twin and I, I didn't want to believe it, but I knew it was so and I, his spirit rose up from me and my spirit wanted to go with him. Dr. Raymond Bryant lost his twin Robert early in life. After years of struggling to understand the supernatural connection he felt with his deceased twin, Dr. Brandt started a support group for other twinless twins. Unequivocally, no doubt in my mind that I experienced a, a factor or an element of death myself when my twin died. And one half of me is dead. And so one, of ha one half of me lives right here where you see me in this cloth. I sense his presence, he's with me. I've had other people die. My mom died, my dad died this last year. And, and I don't feel their presence with me. Um, they're just gone. Um, I'll always love them and they'll always be a part of my life. But it's not like that their lives are, they're living on through me. And Kathy is. You know, you'll always miss someone you love when they die, but when you're a twin, that, that presence, that having her inside you goes on. Carrie Bettis lost her twin, Kathy, when they were only 23. They were very, very close. They, uh, they shared everything together. They, they had their hopes and dreams of rearing their families together, being very close to one another, and, uh, and their children interacting. And then when this uh, devastating experience happened um, with the auto accident, uh, she, she had to go on and, uh, and, and carry on, of course. They said that she was in critical condition. I just hurt, just a hurt all over. And uh, all of a sudden it was gone. I felt fine and I felt such a relief. And then the doctor came out and said that she died. And I knew the minute she died, I knew the minute she was not in pain anymore. For 11 long years, Carrie has suffered the loss of Kathy, and even though she has a growing family to love and care for, Carrie still feels a loss beyond grieving. I think about her every minute of every day. She's just a part of me. I attempted suicide. Kathy's accident, she, the, her car hit the back of a semi-truck, and so I followed a semi clear up to Roseburg, um, which is quite a ways away, thinking I'm gonna hit the back of this truck too. But then my mind would go back and I, heard, I would hear her say, You've got to take care of my kids. Carrie's after-death communication with her twin is more of a feeling than an actual conversation. But other twinless twins report that they can not only feel the presence of their departed twin, but can also speak with them directly. Well, and I were very close. Sometimes it almost frightening how close we were. A lot of times we would think alike. Uh, we'd feel the same pains that one would feel. Robert McGowan lost his twin, Ronald, later in life after a long bout with cancer. As I looked at the casket, I could hear him say, Bobby, it's just a box going down on the ground. I'm still here right behind you. I knew physically he was gone. 
But mentally, he wasn't gone. He's staying here with me. Some psychologists believe that these separation pangs are simple manifestations of grief. But the twins themselves counter that grief cannot explain the supernatural encounters they routinely experience. When I look in the mirror, I really have some question. Is that, is that me or is that Robert? Every time I look in the mirror, I see Ronald, I start talking. Kathy's been gone 11 years. And about three years ago, I glanced in the mirror and and it was more my reflection looking back. I know it's me in the mirror, but it's a lot of her too. Dr. Bryant's study is ongoing. He's interested in hearing from other surviving identical twins who believe that they have had after death communication. Dr. Bryant's Twinless Twins organization is located in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Next, did a CIA experiment lead to this man's murder? I definitely do not believe Frank Olson committed suicide. I feel there was an altercation prior to his going out the window. Then the frightening consequences of cloning. And can we see the world through our pet's eyes? LSD, three letters that conjure up an entire turbulent decade. But long before Timothy Leary told a generation of baby boomers to tune in, turn on, and drop out, the CIA was secretly dosing government employees with LSD. These were unwitting human guinea pigs, and in at least one case, the results may have been fatal. Did Frank Olson jump, or was he pushed? That is the question that faces psychic detective Kathleen Ray, who has come to the scene of the crime, room 1018A in New York City's Statler Hotel. The unanswered questions about what happened in this room have plagued Olson's family for over 40 years. As far as I'm concerned, it was not a planned suicide. On a cold November night in 1953, Frank Olson, an army scientist and father of three, plunged 13 stories to his death from his room at the Statler Hotel. For me, it was catastrophic. I mean, there was no, it was nothing short of catastrophic. Eric Olson was only nine years old when his father died. He grew up never knowing what really happened. As an adult, he vowed to find out for himself the truth about his father's life and death. Frank Olson was a branch chief for the Army Special Operation Division in their Biological Warfare Division at Fort, at Fort Detrick in Maryland. Author John Marks is an authority on the U.S. government's covert operations during the Cold War. While researching the CIA's involvement in top-secret biological warfare, Marks learned a lot about Frank Olson. Frank Olson was very much a witting participant in the, in the idea that you could disable individuals or kill individuals through the, the use of biological warfare, which means that he was a specialist in putting the plague into an aerosol can. Frank Olson was a patriot who believed his role in the creation of biological weaponry was essential to national security. He was just the kind of strong-minded scientist the CIA was looking for to test a new truth serum called LSD. As part of the CIA's testing of LSD program, they needed to find out how people would react to the drug if they didn't know they were getting the drug. There was a meeting, a small meeting held at Deep Creek Lake in the western um, part of Maryland, um, where uh, a small group of scientists associated with my father's research division were going to hold discussions together with these guys from the CIA. They gave everybody a drink of Cointreau, which had LSD in it. Frank Olson was one of the people who drank that um, LSD slash Cointreau and um, had a very bad experience with it. Some say the experience broke him. Olson became despondent, paranoid. He wanted out. But before the CIA would release him from the project, they insisted that he go to New York City for a psychiatric evaluation. He called my mother, the first call that he'd made to her since he'd been in New York, and he said that he felt good and he was, you know, looking forward to coming back to Frederick the next day. And she was very relieved because she thought he sounded, you know, sounded fine. Um, but a few hours later, he <laughs> went through the window. What happened in the two hours between the time Frank Olson made that optimistic phone call and his fatal fall through the frigid New York night? Retired hotel manager Armand Pastore was on duty that night. He was the first to reach Frank Olson. And he kept looking at me, and his mouth was moving and working, but nothing was coming out. He couldn't understand anything he was saying. It was like mumbling. 
but he was definitely trying to tell me something, and he was looking straight at me. It's a night Pastore will never forget. A man was dead, and the circumstances surrounding his death were extraordinary. A hotel operator told Pastore that just moments after Olson's death, a call had been placed from Olson's room, and the operator had listened in. He said, well, he's gone, and the fellow at the other end said, that's too bad. And they both hung up. Well, from the moment I heard that, I knew there was something terribly wrong. The CIA will not confirm the identity of the man in Olson's room that night, but Eric Olson believes he was a CIA agent who had a hand in his father's death. The police came in first. I followed them in, and they're sitting in the commode with his head in his hands, like that. And the police said, well, what happened? And he said, all I heard was a glass crash, and he was gone. I don't remember anything else, he said. I'm sure he didn't say exactly what happened because they were in the middle of a cover-up. 22 years after his death, in 1975, the CIA finally admitted that Frank Olson had been an unwitting participant in an LSD experiment. But they insisted that Olson's death had been a suicide. Eric Olson believes otherwise. Sightings offered the services of Kathleen Ray to see if she could provide any details about the crucial minutes before Olson's death. There were three steps they had to do in order to put your father in the condition to have him here in this room to where they could get your father out the window. Many of Ray's psychic impressions match the empirical research of Dr. James Stars, a professor of law and forensic science at George Washington University. We're taking a flying run coming from across the room all the way through up to the window. And you take a leap through, even if you cleared this top bar, wouldn't some part of your body, whatever part, have been snared by the glass. Dr. Stars has spent two years studying the case and agrees with Psychic Ray. There is strong evidence of foul play. Stars commissioned a computer model to graphically illustrate Frank Olson's last minutes. We were able to create an animation that shows the two scenarios involved in the death of Frank Olson. Michelle Saber is a consultant for Engineering Automation Incorporated, a company which specializes in biomedical engineering. The process uses the basic laws of physics to recreate Frank Olson's fall. The animation that's on the left side of the screen illustrates the scenario involving a suicide. And the one to the right side of the screen shows a homicide. And in that photo, you can see an image of two people pushing Frank Olson out the window. I think that if he did go through the window, as the, the traditional version has it on his own, uh, there would have had to have been some kind of a running start or a run uh, in conjunction with it because he had to clear a window sill that was 31 inches off the floor. He had to clear a radiator in front of it. This is a man who uh, apparently with the shade drawn, the window down, literally flies through the air uh, and by the luck of the draw, went through the window and the shade and managed to get through unimpeded. Because of his relentless research, Dr. Stars gathered enough evidence to have the body of Frank Olson exhumed. When Dr. Stars examined the skull, he found something the original autopsy had not mentioned. A stunning blow to the head by some person or instrument prior to exiting through the window. Was this significant wound simply overlooked during the original autopsy, or was it omitted? According to Dr. Stars, the injury could not have been caused by Olson's fall. If that were the case, uh, there would have been uh, a fracture of the uh, underlying bone, and we didn't have that. If someone had hit him in the head by a fist or, fought, or thrown his head against a wall, uh, that bump could have arisen in that fashion. Dr. Stars considered the possibility that Frank Olson had suffered the blow to his head exiting the window, but after on-site study has ruled that out. He went through with his arms extended forward. Those arms clearly would have taken the brunt of the window and the shade before the rest of his body did. Kathleen Ray had no knowledge of Dr. Starr's forensic evidence or the skull marks he had found when she made these comments. He is threatening something that they feel would be very dangerous to their work. But I feel that somehow he gets over here to where he gets this part of it, the, the upper left part of his head is hurt. I don't feel it has to be crushed, but I feel like it's hurt. I felt there was an altercation uh, prior to his going out the window, 
And when I stop and think about it, uh, one is across the forehead here. Uh, and this is not from hitting the ground. So I, I, I feel this all happened before the fall. Finally, Ray concludes that Eric's father died at the hands of another. I definitely do not believe Frank Olson committed suicide. It's a conclusion Dr. Starrs has found strong evidence for. When considered in combination with the findings from the scientific investigation, particularly that enigmatic hematoma, are rankly and starkly suggestive of homicide in the death of Dr. Olson. But is the forensic data from Dr. Starrs and the psychic impressions of Kathleen Ray enough to break the seeming conspiracy of silence surrounding Frank Olson's death? His son isn't sure, but he continues to fight for the truth about the father taken from him so long ago. Eric Olson, Frank Olson's son, believes that there is enough new information to warrant a full congressional investigation into the suspicious death of his father. He is currently working towards that end. Next, cloning humans may be a reality within 10 years. Are we prepared for the consequences? There have been experiments that have been uh, frightening in their implication. Within every human embryo, there is enough genetic information to replicate that embryo a thousand times over. It's called cloning, and science and ethics are at loggerheads over what cloning will mean in the future. Some see it as the greatest medical breakthrough in history. Others foresee a Pandora's box from which will spring a thousand Hitlers, a thousand viruses, and perhaps a real-life Jurassic Park. We have to understand that uh, we have a technology here more powerful than any tool ever devised by the human race. Scientists now have the ability to play God, to manipulate the genetic blueprints of life itself, to begin to become the architects, if you will, for evolution. It's easy to imagine misapplications of the technology that we have. I think it's important for us to try to get together and uh, take away some of the fear of the unknown. It's not really as bad as a lot of people seem to think. Since the dawn of time, life on Earth has marched inexorably forward, out of our hands. But as science unravels the secrets of our genetic makeup, life is being created in a laboratory. One of these days, it's going to be, I suppose, relatively commonplace for us to, for example, take cells out of a sick child, put a gene into those cells that the child is lacking, and then return those cells to the child's sick body, and have those cells take over and make the youngster well. I think it's great. But while ethical scientists use cloning to heal sick children, or search for a cure for AIDS, there is a worry about experimenting being conducted on the fringes of mainstream science. Could the fiction of Jurassic Park suddenly become real? I would say the technology to actually read and reconstruct an entire genetic code of a dinosaur is perhaps about uh, 15 years away. Entombed in amber, the petrified remains of prehistoric tree sap. This insect is 95 million years old. Because DNA never dies, it may be possible to remove strands of genetic material from this insect and clone not only the insect, but anything the insect fed on, including a Tyrannosaurus rex. And it's just a matter of going in, getting the information, and replicating it in a modern living cell, and giving that cell an appropriate nucleus, a yolk, and an eggshell and you should be able eventually to hatch living, breathing dinosaurs. Cloning dinosaurs may be years away, but there are genetic experiments going on right now with equally frightening potential. Every day, scientists experiment with recombinant DNA and make ethical decisions with a global impact. Recombinant DNA is the heart of the genetic engineering revolution. Uh, recombinant DNA means recombining DNA taking snippets of DNA from unrelated species and splicing them together to create novel organisms that have never existed in evolution or in classical breeding. Scientists have taken a human growth hormone gene, placed the gene into mice embryo. The mice are born with a human gene replicating in every cell of their body. The mice grow twice as big as any mice in history, and they pass that human gene into every generation of their offspring. 
My own feeling is that geneticists as, as a whole are very, very responsible about what they do, and they spend a lot of time thinking about the implications of what can happen with our new genetic technology. But geneticists as a whole fails to take into account rogue scientists with their own agenda. We have thousands and thousands of scientists working in laboratories all around the world today. And the public is not aware of this, but they are snipping together genes, re-editing genes, recombining genes, creating novel new plants, animals, and microorganisms that we have never seen on this earth. As the ongoing experiments continue, who will be there to decide when to stop? Now, what happens when genetic technology gets down to this level where it's widely available to anyone? And uh, you have some splinter in some part of the world that uh, comes up with some very insane agenda. And uh, this is what you always have to worry about. You have to worry about the Saddam Husseins and the Adolf Hitlers of history popping up anywhere. Some scientists have estimated that we are only 10 years away from the ability to clone a genetically engineered human being. If I scratch a cell off my body here, that cell has the complete genetic information to clone an identical copy of myself. We are already in the era of genetic engineering of human beings. Scientists have already uh, performed genetic surgery, genetic therapy, changing the actual genetic instructions in individuals. This is now not a theoretical issue, it's an engineering question. We can do a lot of the things that 30 years ago or so we thought were really quite fantastic. And we do think very seriously about the implications of what we can do if we were to start going a few steps further. We think very carefully about it. Germany has all but outlawed recombinant DNA research. Apparently, many leaders in that nation have decided that any potential medical advances are far outweighed by the potential horror of a genetic experiment going awry. When we get to the issue of evolution and the future of biology on this planet, perhaps we ought to ask this question. Is there any institution or group of individuals wise enough, clairvoyant enough, trustworthy enough that we ought to entrust with them the blueprints for the future of life on Earth? The battle between science and ethics is being played out right now in Washington, D.C. Researchers at George Washington University have been ordered to destroy the world's first successful clone of a human embryo, ordered to destroy it because they did not follow federal ethics rules. The researchers counter that their work is too important to destroy, no matter what. Coming up, this woman has a special vision that could save your pet. Once I make the connection, the first thing that I need to ask the animal is, are you alive? Do we humans have an underdeveloped psychic ability to communicate with animals? Psychic Carol Gurney believes that we all do, and that she has been able to develop her own ability to communicate between species. She uses her ability during desperate circumstances when someone is searching for their lost pet. It's actually a most blending with the animal and becoming them and really feeling as they feel for that moment. Carol Gurney uses the term interspecies communicator to describe her unique psychic ability. I'll sit and in my mind silently I'll say the name of the animal perhaps three times and then slowly begin to make that connection with the animal. Gurney believes that it is this telepathic connection which enables her to locate missing pets. Once I make the connection, the first thing that I need to ask the animal is, are you alive? If I get yes, then I go on and I ask a series of questions to the animal. Are you lost? Or do you know where you are? She uses meditation to clear her mind of human thoughts and key into what she believes are the animal's thoughts. Oftentimes when the animal is scared and they are truly lost, then it's my job to ask, you know, what, what do you see? Look to the right, look, you know, what do you see when you look up? What do you see when you look to the left? Because sometimes they're really scared. It was like losing my best friend. She was very much, um, she's always there. You know, was always ready to greet me when I came home and just all those things that you have a dog for and was part of the family, it was like another child. John Slosser contacted Carol Gurney after his dog, Susie, disappeared. 
When I got in touch with Susie, she was still alive, but very panicked. And she showed me a picture of crossing Pacific Coast Highway. And she showed me a picture of cactus that she had seen um, and horses that she had been by and also other animals, other dogs that were behind fences and one particular black dog that she wanted to make contact with. She had also seen a horse crossing sign, but I think most importantly with, with this case, she kept showing me something orange. By the day after I called her, Carol called me back and said she had made contact with Susie and that the dog was alive. And she started describing to me the area where Susie might be, you know, might be found. A couple of days later, Susie was found in an area that matched Gurney's visions in every detail. I went to the area where the dog was found and it had a horse crossing sign. It had a corral with a horse. It had a black dog that had befriended Susie. It had all the elements and it had the orange fencing, which was surprising. It was the, the orange fencing is only used at like, construction sites. And this area had all those elements. Tina Sachs lost her dog, Calamity, in the confusion following the Northridge, California earthquake in 1994. When I contacted Calamity, um, the sense was that she was alive. So from there, I asked her questions, where, where are you? And the first response I got was, I'm in the hills. She had asked me, are there any mountains around you? And the first ones I thought of was at the top of Topanga, Rocky Peak. And she says, well, you need to go there. Your dog is there. She told me where to go and what to look for. Go to the mountains and look for rocks, uh, horses, old cars, palm trees, and a little house. Tina was encouraged to try and form her own psychic link with Calamity. In my head, I'm talking to my dog. And, and telling her, you know, Calamity, come home, you have food, you have water, mommy's looking for you. Tina followed her instincts and Gurney's clues, and just as predicted, Calamity was found in the mountains near a small abandoned building. I think it was the next day Tina called me in tears, so happy because she had found uh, Calamity. I lost her for eight days, and if it wasn't for Carol, I never would have found her, never. We're born with the ability to communicate telepathically with animals. And what's happened is because we're such an intellectual society, we've just forgotten how to do it. Carol Gurney believes that in order to receive messages from our pets, we must first learn to be good listeners. And that means occasionally clearing our minds of mundane thoughts and developing what Gurney calls mental quiet. If you can clear the psychic line, so to speak, animals won't get a busy signal when they try to communicate. Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sightings, stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, Dark Shadows. Tonight on Sci-Fi's Farscape, Creighton's inner demons exercised. Pray for your soul, Scorpion, if you have one. Sci-Fi's Farscape, tonight at 9. This is Sci-Fi. Thank you.